You are listening to The Interactome, a podcast by a group of young researchers who want to connect you to the world of science by sharing their stories and perspectives. Just in case their bosses are listening, they want to remind you that the opinions expressed here are their own. They also want to remind you not to take anything they say as medical or professional advice, as they are not doctors. Not yet, anyway. Stay tuned about that. And, without further ado, welcome to the Interactome. Hello, lovely listeners, and welcome back to the Interactome. My name is Maya, and lovely co-hosts, please introduce yourselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe. And I'm Natalie. Sorry for the delay. I just had to shut off my air conditioner for our lovely editor, just in case something goes through. Record temperatures. We're not immune up here in Massachusetts. It's been crazy. Yeah, I was wondering where you went. I was like, Natalie, come back. <laughs> I know. I just but... <laughs> like decided I didn't want to record anymore. I'm like, okay, bye, guys. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we have all three of us here today with a very interesting topic. Um, so this topic has to do um, with something that we've done a really long time ago. So we're going to throw it back to our very first ever interactome media thing we've published on the World Wide Web which was an ancient YouTube video about the central dogma in viruses. So if you want to peruse through the depths of the internet and find our little explainer video where um, I'm drawing little animations while we talk about um, DNA, RNA, and proteins and how that relates to how viruses works, um, you can check that out on YouTube. Um, So check that out if you want to. But today in this podcast episode... We're aiming to go a little bit deeper and more in depth about each of these topics. So today we will be speaking about DNA and genetics. Woo! So, yay! <laughs> um, DNA is so interesting and fun and complicated, so I think it will be a very fun discussion. So I guess we'll start off with the very um, kind of like basic question. Um, what is DNA? What's a gene? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I, uh, it's a like loaded it, question, too. It, it, it actually is. Like, it, I think we, we always go around and say, oh, um, yeah, it's in my genes. Or, yeah, like, oh, it's, it's in my DNA. Or, but, like, what, what is really in your DNA? Like, what really is a gene? How do you define it when really DNA is, like, this, these massive, like, in terms of length, like, ridiculously long strands of this really cool like double helix thing like it's there's a lot there's a lot there to unpack and um i think one one thing to start with is um i have a uh a a mentor who told me dna is the world's most stable molecule it is like it is like this thing that is meant to stay inside of you at like 98 degrees fahrenheit all the time and like be fine it's it's like and it retains just like all this incredible information about what makes an organism really um but in terms of structure um it really is real quick joe what does dna stand for i know it's nucleic acid something but i can't remember yeah uh so uh deoxyribo uh, (laughs) deoxyribonucleic acid um basically um, the, the deoxy refers to removing an oxygen off of a, literally like a sugar that helps make up a piece of DNA. So, um, as compared to RNA or ribonucleic acid, DNA has one less oxygen, basically. That, that's really it. Um, and, those and I will are... say, oh, mm-hmm. go ahead. We all got so excited. No, my, you <laughs> So you're talking about the sugars, like what? What what are the sugars doing in the DNA? Why are we are we sweet on the inside? Like what's going on with that? I, I like to think we're pretty sweet uh, in terms of <laughs> I think we're all pretty cool. Um, but it um, DNA is really like the, or the the this back the, the or the sugars here form a backbone for the DNA. They kind of form the 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 sort of the the sides of the ladder 
that is DNA. And kind of in between each little sugar, you have a phosphate um, group. Um, so it, it kind of goes sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, repeating over and over and over until you get to the end of the DNA strand. And in terms of the rungs of the ladder that make up DNA, uh, we have our bases, and there's four of them. Um, I feel like I've been talking a lot, and I kind of just wanted to stop. <laughs> no, all good. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> it's um, I I think one thing that's so cool about DNA is that you really have to look at an image to kind of grasp what we're trying to explain here. Um, I, I'm sure that a lot of you have seen kind of the double helix in just like traditional media or like maybe like intro to bio classes that you've taken. Um, but it's, it, you know, it's, you've got the two kind of prong, it looks like a V and then another V and that's your chromosome. And inside the chromosome, you zoom way far in and that's where the DNA is. And the DNA is held together. It looks, um, kind of like a ladder, right? And the steps on the ladder, per se, um, are uh, n- called nucleotides. And there are only four. Oh, well, there are five, technically. But we're only going to talk about four right now. <laughs> um, I completely forget what the names are, but I know A is paired with T and C is paired with G. So could use some help from you guys on what the actual names are. Um, yeah. But pretty much anything that your body does, your eyes... Um, right down to like, you know, I I can't even, I can't even think of an example to cite to be like, yeah, your genes are responsible for that because think of something and it is like everything <laughs> about you is like even the, even your, um, cells amplifying or like creating new, not creating new genes. I'm getting excited. I'm going to pause. Yeah. I think one really good example is uh, if any, like one thing that we did in uh, science class well, back in high school was uh, our teacher got these like strips of paper that were like, that we would literally just like put on our tongue. And the, um, some people didn't really like taste anything at all. It was totally fine. Some people thought it was a little sour and some people thought it was really sour. Um, I was one of the people who was like, eh, it's kind of sour like kind of in the middle, um, turns out that that the ability to like to be a sour taster person, you have to have a single mutation, um, like one rung in the ladder has to be switched um, from what it like is in like kind of like, not necessarily the average population, but that the difference in one rung in the ladder is what determines whether you're a sour taster or a non-taster. And there we'll get into this a little later, but there's a reason that I was in the middle of those two extremes. Um, so yeah, but like literally one 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 single base pair of mutation, one change, uh, and suddenly everything or not everything is sour, but these pieces of paper are sour. <laughs> yeah, so, to yeah. go off what both of you are saying, like it really does a lot of things like come down to our genes, whether it's like Joe was saying having the ability to taste sourness on the paper or like, you know, your hair color, your eye color, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And like you said, it really just comes down to like the sequences that are in the DNA. So Natalie mentioned the A's, T's, D's, and C's. So I feel like a lot of people that study biology, we just have like this permanently like ingrained in our heads. So we always remember A to T, A to T, T to A, C to G, G to C. So like um, that way we can never get it wrong on our tests, but um, so that we remember which um, bases or nucleotides pair together. So um, to go over that, um, the A stands for adenine, C stands for cytosine, um, G stands for guanine and T stands for thymine. Um, I know I'm getting a PhD in biology, but I like Googled it just to make sure. <laughs> so, I was like, <laughs> there's a lot of like, um, okay, well, to be honest, like a lot of them like sound the same because it's like ene at the end. So I'm like, oh man, I don't want to mess it up. So, <laughs> but adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine um, are A's, T's, G's, and C's. A's always match to T's and vice versa, and C's always match to G vice versa. Um, And these are unique bonds that the rungs of the ladder in the DNA um, contain. And 
depending on your ordering of different A's, T's, G's, and C's, um, this can affect how well you taste sour things and um, your hair color and eye color. I feel like there's an episode title in here somewhere, like ABCs, ATGs, like something like that, like ATGs of genetics or something like that. Also, for context, uh, ATG is a start codon, which we'll, we'll get to what that is later. So I think that that could be a cool episode title. Oh, yeah. I think also one thing that, that we should add is that, yes, genes are responsible for whether you taste sour paper or your hair color, but they also make really um, like small things that you might not notice, like the proteins that are made in your body. Like Those don't just kind of come out of nowhere. Your own body produces those using the information that's in your genes. Your cells will create new proteins and produce things. Um, and that's uh, just a part of genetics that like you, we quite literally can't live without it sort of yeah. thing. Like these proteins are responsible for life as we know it. Yeah, they do a lot of important things in the cells, and you can think of genes as like a big recipe book um, for how to make all of these proteins and things like that. So um, if you imagine that uh, we, t we touched upon that, like the DNA is like kind of like this like ladder like structure, and then they're kind of compounded into bigger structures called chromosomes, which is basically a lot of DNA all together in one place. Um, it's basically like if your recipe book in your kitchen was like made out of like really long spaghetti that had like sugar <laughs> and like phosphates and sugar and phosphates and then like little spaghettis in between the longer spaghettis that are like all all the bases and then um somehow that really really long spaghetti can be um red and turned into a lot of very functional things that our cells can use yeah i think another thing to mention um this collection of all your genes and all your dna um is called your genome like the ohm meaning kind of like sort of like collection of all of the all, all of the things that are related to this subject like the gene all the genes the genome i i yeah it's um you'll hear that word genome genomics uh, we've talked about omics a little bit before in previous episodes but i think it's worth it's worth restating again just because it's such an important term um but yeah and also, um, how, like, how are, like, what is the structure of a gene? Like, how do we, how do we know, like, where, where a gene starts at another, like, and the gene ends? Like, if it's all just, like, this one big, like, spirally ladder thing. Um, I think that's a really, really important question, question because mm -hmm. a lot, because even though, you know, we're stressing how important genes are and how they give us life. There's a lot of junk in there. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't uh, end up really amounting to everything. No proteins, nothing. It's just kind of extra information. And our cells need to figure out how to tell what's extra information and what's not, and then what to do with that. Yeah. And it's actually like pretty complicated what you were saying, Joe, like how do we determine like what counts as a gene and like where it starts and where it ends? Like um, people are still actively figuring that out. And there's a lot of like new definitions um, being added to our biological textbook as we speak. Um, so for instance, uh, in my research program, this is a very um, hot topic of interest mm -hmm. to gene regulation biologists. We're like, yeah, what the heck is a gene anyway? We have no idea. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, there's a lot of since um, since people have studied genes and we've been studying them for decades and decades, like um, we've departed from kind of like a canonical kind of definition of what a gene is and um there's like really long genes really short genes now genes within genes it's kind of crazy it's ingenious um, it's ingenious you're completely joe you're correct. blocked <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm blocking you <laughs> like pun jail immediately <laughs> so it's a i think like an ever evolving definition which is really exciting but um but to kind of like get behind the textbook definition of a gene um uh, like we mentioned before, a gene contains instructions um, for your cell to make a specific protein or like thing that it uses to carry out different jobs in the cell. Um, so genes can contain or genes do contain a coding sequence. 
Um, so it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, the gene has a sequence, so the A's, T's, G's, and C's rearranged in different combinations. Um, this coding sequence is the part of the gene that tells um, the cell, oh, we're going to make this specific protein out of this specific combination of A's, T's, G's, and C's. This codes for the protein that we're trying to make. I think uh, one thing to add is like, there's a specific way that the cell sort of decodes or translates this information um, that's in the genome into like an actual protein. Um, but that, that gets into the subject of like RNA biology and protein biology. And I think it's something that we're definitely going to talk about, but we'll save it until a later date probably because that's, that's a whole episode in and of itself. Yeah, and then um, to go a further layer into that, so inside the coding sequences of the genes, um, if you are a complex mammalian organism, um, you can have things called exons and introns. Um, so this sounds very futuristic to me. When I remember when I was reading it, I was like, ooh, like an exon sounds like a thing you would find on like a spaceship or something like that. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, they still kind of have a cool job, so... Um, basically, in a coding sequence, you can have a mixture of exons and introns. Um, introns are kind of like what Natalie was mentioning earlier. Like these are sequences that are kind of like junky. They don't really like do much. Um, so most of the time they're removed um, from the gene sequence and they don't make it into the final protein that's made as a result. Um, whereas the exons contain kind of like the important like meaty stuff of the um, gene sequence. Um, and this can mean that it contains like specific parts of the protein, different domains, signal sequences, that kind of thing. Um, so think of exons as like the kind of like meaty parts of the protein again, um, and introns as kind of like the junky parts that can be removed. And something that's cool is that um, in cells, sometimes there's this additional layer of like regulation or mix and matching where um, you can have specific combinations of introns and exons in your um, gene that you're trying to make into a protein. So you can have like exons one and two um, or have them cut out completely and only have exon three, that kind of thing. Um, if anyone cares to elaborate more, um, feel free to. <laughs> I think my favorite thing about introns and, ex and exons um, was when I first learned about them, my biology teacher, and I can't remember if this was in high school or college, but they were like, you know, you'd think that exons, you remove them because of X, right? But it's actually counterintuitive. The introns, which you would think would be kept in, are the ones that are removed. So that's why even like I still remember that to this day. It's a little memory yeah. trick. It's kind of funny. I, I remember like learning this for the first time and I was like, introns do not stay in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Contrary to what you might think, they are not there. <laughs> I've, I've always thought of introns as kind of like being in between the things that oh. the information that's like expressed. That uh, makes more sense. That's exactly. probably what it is. <laughs> well, I, I don't yeah. think that, I, I don't know if the whole, that second part, like this is what is expressed is entirely accurate for reasons that maybe we won't get into here but um yeah i think the uh the, also this like exon shuffling stuff is like the the actual like name for that phenomenon was called rna splicing um which we'll, we're definitely going to talk about later like maybe not on this episode oh, yeah. but like that and then to clarify that's what i was kind of alluding to when i was like oh you get like exon one and two at the end or maybe you might just get exon three because like different ones are getting taken out with the introns so very cool. Splicing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and then the, the other thing, I, th I think that what's really important to, ha to mention is that there's a, like, there's a, you kind of, um, you have a region sort of, or two regions, one before your coding sequence and one after your coding sequence. Um, this first one is called the promoter. Um, that, that it like promotes the reading of the gene by different proteins that do the reading. Um, in particular, one called RNA polymerase 2. Go figure. It's not 1 or 3 or 7. It's 2. Um, and RNA polymerase 2 
will kind of bind or, or stick to this promoter sequence. And then it will literally like kind of just zip along the DNA, reading the information, turning that DNA information into RNA, um, and which is then used later on to make proteins. Um, and then when it gets to the end of the gene, um, it hits a terminator sequence. And at that terminator sequence, that's where um, the, the, RNA, the making of the RNA stops and the polymerase just kind of like leaves or gets off the DNA and goes to another section to do the whole thing all over again. Um, I would highly encourage all of you, um, if you're driving, don't do this. Um, <laughs> no, actually, if you're driving, pull over and pull up um, YouTube right now. Um, but watching videos of this kind of like the ORF or like the promoter going through all the open reading frames like and reading the DNA. It's so cool to visualize it. And there are some really good visualizations online. Um, and we'll drop some on social too when this episode comes out. But um, I, that's like one of my absolute favorite things um, like in biology class when they would like play those GIFs. Yeah, the polymerase, um, like Joe is mentioning, like on the on the DNA, <laughs> when it's like kind of like settling on there and reading through and getting off there, like in the videos, it's like so funny because it's like noom, it's like moving so fast, it's like a little race car <laughs> and it on does, the DNA. It, it, it actually it moves that fast. Noom. It's so cool. Like it's honestly, really fast. Yeah. Yeah. Like these proteins, they 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 just go. They're 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 just going. They're 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 speedy boys. Um, Lightning, Lightning McQueen. Light, Lightning McQueen. Except, <laughs> Ka-chow. except yeah, Lightning Mc, uh, DNA. I don't know. Um, <laughs> That'll but, be the episode name. Oh God. Uh, <laughs> but um, one one important thing to mention, I think, is uh, just kind of like how you get your DNA, which like I I mean I think all like you like all, everyone who's listening and all of us kind of have a general sense that like oh. You get some DNA from your mom and some from your dad. Um, and, like, what that really looks like is, like, when we're talking, we mentioned chromosomes earlier, these big clumps of DNA, uh, which literally, if you look in the 3D, like, center of the cell or the nucleus where it's all kept, they literally just, like, look like big clumps until they're, um, until it's time to make copies of them. And that's when you get the cool, like, X shapes and Y shapes and stuff like that. But um, you get 23 from your mom. And 23 from your dad. Um, or, or I should specifically say uh, from the male parent and the female parent. Uh, and so this basically when you form a new organism, when the, uh, the egg cell gets um, or in the sperm cell fused together, then you get um, each one of those has 23 chromosomes. And then you actually get uh, 23 chromosome pairs or 46 chromosomes total. Um, and that all those chromosomes contain all your genetic information, and that's how liter- that's how you get fifty percent from mom and fifty percent from dad, and that's how you get the mix and match to make a new person. Um, and to plug our mighty mitochondria episode, um, if you are curious on how to get or how to inherit genetic material from three parents, um, so a maternal parent, paternal parent. Uh, like Joe was saying, and a mitochondrial parent. Um, you can check that out. We discuss more how, about how that happens. Yeah, cool stuff. Um, but yeah, there's a whole other genome in your cells, which we aren't getting into here, but look at our that episode. Um, yeah. yeah. Genomes are, are crazy, and I feel like, you know, what's even more interesting is not even the human genome, but um, genomes are so different across different species and organisms. Um, So, for example, plants are crazy for no reason. Like, they have so many copies of chromosomes, and I feel like everyone is just like, why? Why do they have so many? So, for example, I believe that strawberries are octoploid, which means that they have eight copies of each chromosome. Um, Back me up on that. But they definitely have a lot more. How many do we have? We have two copies of every chromosome. Diploid. Diploid. So octoploid um, means that they have eight copies. Um, So why? What are they planning? What's the agenda? (laughs) (laughs) The strawberry agenda. I need to know their sit. Like, why do they have so many? It's so strange. Plants are crazy. (laughs) One really weird thing about plants, like 
you can actually like treat them with a certain chemical that prevents their cells from like dividing i believe and so they end up with like double the amount of chromosomes that each cell is supposed to have and they're totally fine you do that with humans and that's called cancer um so <laughs> so like plants are just like they're just something else like they like everyone's like oh they kind of just like grow and they're there but like plants are actually way more complex than us in some cases um like they're they're just don't mess with plants that's all let us know if you want a plant episode (laughs) are you planting the seed now natalie oh that was beautiful you don't you don't have to go to pun jail for that one (laughs) that was that was well executed I'm, i'm very glad i appreciate it yeah, you know, I think that um, when the apocalypse happens, it'll just be plants left on the world, maybe as it should be. Um, like in Wally, the rest of us are yeah, and yeah, while the rest of us are annihilated, but you know, plants are plants. <laughs> yeah, um, th- I think the other the other thing regarding um, regarding strawberries is just kind of another fun science experiment you could do in your home. Um, like just get a, you could get a bunch of strawberries, a cheesecloth. Like some water, some salt, some dish soap, and uh, maybe some uh, some rubbing alcohol if you have it. Um, and you can actually see D- you can extract the DNA from the strawberries. And strawberries are good good to do this with because you can like since they have so much DNA, you can actually see a lot. Uh, like literally, um, I did this in high school. I've done it. I've done it a few times since. And when you, you literally, like, you add soap to break open these strawberry cells, because cells are literally kind of just, like, these bubbles of fat. Like, that, that's really what they are. And when you add soap, it just kind of breaks them open, and you get, like, the DNA inside. And uh, when you kind of, like, switch it around with a little rubbing alcohol, it causes the DNA to clump up and, like, turn like, kind of, like, whitish uh, when you get enough of it all together. You could see like these weird clumpy stringy thingies floating in your little like your little glass of like your mixture of soap and water and it's 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 i i think i did a freshman year of high school and it was one of the coolest things i'd done up until that point and I, like i all like maya and i like we, we're still doing this kind of thing today like it's a little more complex a little more uh <laughs> refined but this is something you could do in your own home and so just look up strawberry dna extraction it's a fun yeah, and it's it's yeah, and it's like you were saying, it uses the same principles of like the the fancy DNA extraction that we do in our lab. Um, but you know, it's easy to see with strawberries and their ungodly amounts of DNA. Oh, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, that's the thing that I really liked about the um, strawberry DNA extraction experiment is that um, I actually have personally never done this experiment, but I imagine it is very fun. Um, but it's something that um, a lot of students in my program, so graduate students in my program, do um, when they're volunteering with like um, middle school and elementary school kids. They do the strawberry DNA experiment. Um, and I remember one of my friends told me that, oh, I did this experiment when I was like in elementary school, middle school, and now I'm doing it again for kids that are in elementary school and mm-hmm. middle school. And so I was like, oh, it's a full circle. So, um, it is like a really cool experiment to do and i'm wondering how many scientists are out there because of strawberry dna yeah i i'm one of them (laughs) this strawberry made me a scientist yes and then i ate it and then (laughs) ew it's soapy though (laughs) no i I didn't i i've eaten many a strawberry but not those strawberries for context there usually there isn't much strawberry that looks appetizing after this um usually turns into like a ball of pig goop um yeah yeah also okay so a uh, note for pickle we can cut this because i don't know if it's appropriate but i wanted to tell you guys the story anyway. <laughs> um but but um so so about like the strawberry dna experiment um so in uh, to preface this experiment the volunteers that like do this with like the elementary school kids like ask them like oh what do you know about dna like how have you heard about it before um, oh, just no. like see what they know or where they <laughs> like where they've seen it before so my friend um the one that said oh i did strawberry dna as a kid now i'm doing it for like the um kids themselves so my friend said that in his class his students said that um oh yeah like dna is the thing that's like on like the maury show like who's your father <laughs> and then he just like 
couldn't really respond to that because he didn't know what to say. I mean, they're not incorrect. They're not they're wrong. wrong. They're not wrong. <laughs> but, and yeah. they use a PCR for that. Check out That's our true. PCR episode. Modern episode. My modern modern science. <laughs> oh yeah. But yeah, but I don't I don't know if we want to include that or not. I don't know if like this like little kid out there somewhere will just like hear this one day and be like, I've been exposed. <laughs> I think it's funny. <laughs> I think it's funny. Yeah. And it's it's okay. an important it's an important part too. It's an And if part. that's where they've heard of it, that's where they've heard of it. Yeah. It's part of it. Yeah. All right. Well, I will I'll think about this and leave it up to Pickle's discretion. Uh, Anyways. <laughs> yeah. Back to gene- genomes. Um, the <laughs> Not that we weren't not talking about genomes, but the I think another cool genome, kind of like we talked about, like one with a lot of DNA and one with not a, like a lot less DNA is like bacteria, where they literally like they have one little one big like it's not really big in comparison to the strawberry dna but it's just one their their entire genome is contained in this one circular dna strand um and like things can just kind of like the rna polymerase that reads it can just kind of like chug around in the circle um and kind of just do what it needs to do and sometimes there are bacteria will also have other little little even tinier circles called plasmids that they can share with each other to uh pass on different like like resistance to different kinds of antibiotics or things like that um which is really really cool um and or very bad if you are someone who's dealing with antibiotic resistant bacteria um but hopefully but good for them yeah good for, good for bacteria bad for the person a win. hopefully no a win. One, yeah hopefully you don't have to deal with that and if you have i'm sorry um but the the really cool thing about bacterial genomes is that they're super super compact like, they don't really have introns at all. Uh, like, it, it all really depends on, like, the complexity of an organism. Like, what what do they really, like, do they really, do they need to pack everything in, like, as tight as possible? Do they not? Like... Well, I guess to that point, Joe, then why, if, um, why do we need introns then? Because... Yeah. You would think that, okay, if we've got all this genetic information, we probably want to keep it as compact as possible. Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of new information coming out about this. Um, But historically, introns have been seen as like kind of just junk. Um, But it does seem that introns, in a lot of cases, are actually very important for controlling um either like how a gene is being read um or for promoting the ability of the cell to do rna splicing like you actually need a specific sequence within the intron in order to effectively do rna splicing and mixing and matching um so there is some there is some functionality there but you don't necessarily need it to make the specific protein and so it's, it's context dependent but there is there, we're starting to learn a lot more. Um, but there, it is true there's also uh, kind of just a random tangent. Um, there are actually many different uh, like random bits of viruses in our genome, um, which sometimes like slowly over time, they may evolve to be something that we use. But sometimes they're just there and the body is like trying to constantly keep them from not making virus, which is kind of scary but kind of interesting too we're never alone nope <laughs> no we're really not we're never alone nope. um so we've talked a lot about um what genes are and how you get your genes right and sort of just the overall makeup but i think one thing that's super important to touch on is can your genes change and the answer is yes and there are a few reasons Um, so that's called a mutation. Um, when your gene changes, that can be, um, naturally occurring. Sometimes when your, um, cells are just kind of reading the DNA, um, transcribing it, making it into that protein, sometimes they make mistakes. And there are a lot of, um, intricate parts, a lot of intricate steps to make sure these mistakes aren't detrimental 
um, or life ruining. Um, but mistakes are made and sometimes they don't matter and sometimes they do. And um, you can also get, there can also be mistakes given your environment. So say sun exposure. You've been exposed for the sun too long. You haven't put on sunscreen. When you get more tan or when you get burnt, that's DNA damage. Like your skin, is, like your skin cells are fundamentally changing from the UV. Yeah. I think the, it's, it, DNA damage is like a whole, it could be a whole episode in and of itself. But the body really does have like a lot of mechanisms that are actively trying to make sure your DNA stays the way it's supposed to. Um, and but like one of the like the most common situations in which you might get a mutation is when you're actually trying to copy the DNA. Um, and so in um, in these cases, like usually like the the protein that copies the DNA called DNA polymerase um, has, does a pretty good job at proofreading things and double checking to make sure it's got stuff right. But sometimes it doesn't. Uh, sometimes it does get things wrong. And that's a very common, or that's a common place where you may get a mutation. Uh, rel- when I say common, I mean like it's not like you're magically going to turn into a completely different organism or something like that. But like you may develop a mole or you might get a, a, a birthmark or a little little freckle or things like that. Like those, those kinds of things can lead to a mutation. But when mutations really matter is when they're in the germline, um, which is like the germline is, are, is the cells that are kind of like have the genetic information that's going to get passed down to your offspring. Uh, and so when a mutation occurs within the germline, like in, within those cells, though, that's going to get passed down to your kids and your kids' kids and their kids. Um, so that's when a mutation really matters evolutionarily. Now, your gene, your, if you get a mutation like anywhere in your body or more, that's called a somatic mutation um, where like, let's say I can, if I like, I'm get a, uh, like I'm out of the sun a lot, I'm not putting on sunscreen and suddenly like I have some DNA damage and some proteins that were supposed to help prevent cancer and keep your cells growing at a normal rate are suddenly mutated so they can't work anymore. Um, that's a somatic mutation. And in this case, it would be a disease-causing somatic mutation. Um, and so that's um, germline versus somatic mutations are an important thing to distinguish between. Um, and so if someone says, oh, this is going to mutate your DNA, you should wonder how and uh, <laughs> which cells. Um, and in general... And will it be passed down will it to be passed your down? future generations? Is it yeah. in the germline? Yeah. Yeah, those are important questions to ask. I wanted to bring it back to what you said about um, evolution because uh, we talked about how mutations can be bad, um, but they can also be good. Um, and kind of like a very, a very, very, very long, long, long time of mutations accumulating and building up um, in organisms is how evolution happens. So let's say that um i think like a a classic example is like you have like a little mouse that lives in the desert or something like that um and then one day um maybe randomly spontaneously a mutation arises in um the the machinery that makes the pigment of the mouse so um one mouse with a random mutation might end up being like a like darker color that stands out against the desert floor while whereas like another mouse might get like a random mutation that makes them the same color as a desert floor um so when you have um when it's snack time for the predators in the desert Mm -hmm. um they they can really clearly see that little mouse that stands out across the desert floor and eat them up right away but however our lucky mouse with the lucky mutation um that matches the color of the desert floor is able to um hide away from everyone else and live and then um if they were extra lucky that mutation is in the germline like joe was saying and now they're going to pass down this light colored coat to their offspring um and then those little mice will be able to live on the desert floor without being detected so it's all of these like little changes over a lot of time so um kind of like the effects of mutations like don't happen overnight for most things it takes years and years and years for things to evolve and kind of accumulate these bigger changes um 
So that's kind of like, I guess, like the reason why um, we are how we are and animals are as they are and everything else in the world all over the grand course of time and different mutations. Yeah, I think I think evolution could really like I don't have the expertise to discuss evolution, but uh, or beyond like kind of what we've talked about here. But I think it would be really cool to do an episode on evolution at some point. Like, I think we really do need to. Um, and but um I think it, 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 it's important to note that um, if you're really hoping that your hair color will change, uh, like let's say I, I, I like I like my hair, it's, it's blackish, a um, little, little hint of brown, apparently. I think it's mostly black. Um, <laughs> I but, see your like, hair is say, just black. Sorry? I see your hair is just black. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but if I, if I w- just really felt the need to be have blonde hair or something like that, or like red hair or something like that. Um, I, it's not like I'm going to get a mutation that will suddenly change my, all, all of my hairs all at once. Like this, the, like the, like any, like these changes in traits literally take millions and millions of years, many, 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 many generations to happen. Uh, so it's, um, it is incorrect to expose yourself to the sun and think that you are going to magically get stronger or something like that because you got a mutation. So and please uh, wear your sunscreen. Please, please wear, sunscreen. wear your please sunscreen. Please wear your sunscreen. There was a recent survey that went out where it was like, and I'll I'll need to find it, but Gen Z cares more about being tan than preventing skin cancer. That was like the headline of the study, and it's like if that's you, don't do it. Just put on sunscreen. It's a it's a cost benefit analysis, like look, looking good versus not getting cancer. <laughs> like, it's it, it, you got you got to weigh the options there, you know. And then when you're yeah. older, you'll look good, and you probably exactly. might not have cancer. Exactly. Because yeah, UV <laughs> exposure can accelerate aging, so you get wrinkles faster. So, um, I put on sunscreen every day because I refuse to age. <laughs> and Maya is immortal. Thank Spoiler. you. Thank you. And to all of my tan girlies like myself, it doesn't matter how naturally tan you are, you can still get sun damage. So make sure you wear your sunscreen. Yeah. I think um, another thing that we should mention kind of one, now that we're on the topics of like evolution and environment is that uh, this, is, this is kind of one of my favorite realms in all of biology, which we will have to do an episode on at some point, um, is this concept of epigenetics. Um, where you you kind of like you have your genetics like the if the, your genetics are the um, the hardware kind of like the or the the recipes in your book of making proteins epigenetics are like kind of the software or the little sticky notes that you've put in over time to say oh actually like we should add six cups of butter. Uh, melted butter <laughs> instead of like two cups and maybe we should add a little less flour or add more water instead like and so it's there are these little little changes uh little little tags or little um different ways of kind of clumping the dna up in the chromosome or things like that that kind of like influence how the dna is read without changing the actual dna sequence and so that's actually a way like you know how like we have if we have one like if our dna is the same in every cell with the exception of like somatic mutations that happen uh how do we get different kinds of cells like other like you'd think that we'd all just be a blob of all the same cells and the reason is epigenetics um and like the it basically controls uh which genes are read in which cells and so i think that's another layer of complexity that happens in a lot of different kinds of organisms ourselves included and so that is um that's something to keep in mind here too like there's a lot more play like obviously your genes really do have a massive massive influence on who you are um but there are other pieces too um and so they're like genes are or epigenetics is often considered the um if, if genetics is like the nature a lot of people think of epigenetics as the nurture um i think that's there is a little more complex than that because your genetics can also influence your epigenetics as well. Um, well, not, I don't think we need to get too deep into that right now. But um, 
Yeah, it's, that's just another cool piece of the puzzle. Yeah, and I think it, if it's under like a even broader kind of like umbrella of gene regulation, so yeah. epigenetics can determine how well your genes are regulated, turned off or on, like Joe mentioned, but even to throw it back to like how we were talking about, oh, the basic structure of the genes, like you have your promoter and your coding sequence and your terminator, like there's a lot of differences in those too. Like some genes have really strong promoters. Others are very weak promoters that controls how well they're made or yeah. um, there's kind of like funky stuff in the coding sequence. Sometimes there's genes within genes that can like make them um, less kind of like read out and made. So there's a lot of a lot of layers to everything. Um, oh, yeah. And it probably um, maybe to get a little philosophical lens a hand Go to how <laughs> thank you L lends a hand to how um complex like we are so how we have so many like different kinds of proteins with different functions all comes from like one set of instructions um with multiple layers of regulation and interpretation to make all these different things so it's very cool yeah i have to, i think like honestly like when i first started out in science i was like oh yeah genes they're kind of there but, like, the, the more I learned, like, holy crap, like, biology is so beautiful. Like, it's it's just, wow. And just thinking about how long this process has been happening for, like, I just think that's just insane. Absolutely mind-blowing. And we're just, like, a little little snapshot. Just a speck. Really. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, ingenious. <laughs> 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 uh, year, years of evolution led up to a singular Joe making ingenious puns. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, thanks. We covered a lot today. So just want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in. We really appreciate it. You can find us on um, Twitter at The Interactome. Um, and on Instagram at, at interactome underscore media. Again, we covered a lot today. So if certain things were more interesting to you, um, let us know. Like we really want to hear feedback from you guys. We want to know kind of what you're interested in hearing about. We could talk about the stuff all day. Um, so again, thank you so much for tuning in. We're excited to hear kind of your thoughts. Um, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.